two. How are we doing this morning? How many of you are thankful that God is on our side and that there's not a battle that he's ever lost? Amen. Come on, if you're thankful for that, I just want to invite you, encourage you, stand up. We're going to worship this morning. The Lord is good. He is so faithful. Hallelujah. Let's sing this out. See miracles. Miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. No, you never lost a battle And I know, I know You never win Oh, thank you, Jesus Sing, everything's possible Everything's possible By the power of the Holy Ghost A new is blowing right now, breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. My walls are all crashing down right now. I know you're able, and my God will come through again. Sing it to us. You can do. Sing it out. You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. You never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle.
Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. Yes, we do. You are the one. Our hearts adore. Sing one more time. Sing Jesus. Jesus, we prayer this morning we just say together as a church that we love you God and thank you that your word tells us that we love you because you first loved us God we thank you that as we celebrate this Christmas season the coming of your son Jesus Christ Lord we can just sit in the reality in the fact God in the beautiful truth that your love is so extravagant that you did not withhold even your own son Jesus Christ so we worship him together in this place today God and we thank you so much for your love which is pervading hearts God which is entering into every situation that's present Lord thank you God that no matter what we have going on Lord we know that your love is constant that you are faithful for all the ages God that you are the same yesterday today and forever and so God we just thank you for that today we love you Lord and we just pray all of these things in Jesus name if you agree church let's give them praise together let's lift up the name of Jesus today Jesus we love you amen and amen hey good morning a2 church it is an absolute honor to have you worshiping with us today this is our connect time all right so hey what we want to do is we want to spend a few minutes say Merry Christmas to some folks that you're sitting next to get to know and say hello to folks that are nearby this is our connect time let's do that Let's try this. Good morning, A2 Church. I know several of you were still fellowshipping and enjoying that time with others, so let's try it one more time. Good morning, A2 Church. You know, we do public baby dedication because as families stand before you, they're admitting we thank God for our families, we thank God for our extended family, and we really thank God for our church, and we need the partnership of our church in raising our children. It's really exciting to me what you're going to see today, both in this experience and in the coming experience. There are major testimonies of God's faithfulness and incredible miracles standing on this stage. So before I introduce you to one family, could we all together give God a great clap offering of praise, thanking Him for His work. Thank you, Jesus. Let me introduce you to these families. This is Brett and Rachel Spurrier. And they're holding Samuel Caleb Spurrier. And at some point in the future, you're going to have to hear the testimony of this child, what God has already done, what he's promised he will do. But we thank God, Brett and Rachel, for, for Samuel today. God bless. And here's another miracle story. This is Joseph and Joan Millwood. And Joan's her, holding their son, Elijah, Jonathan, Gabriel, Millwood. And this, once again, is another one of those major miracles. And this is older sister, Samantha. And God has just been all over this beautiful story. And then I want you to meet the Jones family. This is Vaughn, his wife, Amanda Jones. Can you believe this? I was just thinking, 
how many years ago was it that I got to officiate at your wedding? Seven. And look at this beautiful family God has blessed you with. And Bon was telling me right before the service started about this year being a rapid year of change in terms of job, house, the addition of a baby. And Vaughn is holding Henry Wayman Jones. Let's give all of these families a big warm clap offering. Now, I'm moving off the stage because you came to see the families, not me. And uh, all of these families have family right over here, and we're so honored to have you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. I'm just going to lead you through the commitments that you're making in baby dedication. When you stand here before this audience, you're committing yourself to say, this is a confirmation of my love for God. That's the first thing you're saying, and it's okay. I promise you, he, he's perfectly okay. I've had babies run all across the stage, throw things, grab other people. We're cool here. That's what babies do. It's a confirmation of your love for God. Secondly, baby dedication is recognition of ownership. As you stand here, you're saying this baby truly belongs to God. He or she doesn't belong to us. This child belongs to God. In the words of Hannah, I asked the Lord to give me this baby. And the Lord has granted my request. Third, baby dedication is a symbol of your commitment to raise your child God's way. And dads, I love challenging you at this point because Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Instead, gently take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. And that's what you're committing to do as you stand before both your spouse your, your children, and your church family. And four, through baby dedication, you're claiming God's plan and promise for the life of your child. So I'll just ask you to commit to these things. You're bringing your children into the presence of God to be dedicated to Him. By this statement of faith, you're proclaiming your love for God, recognizing God's ownership of your children. You're committing yourself as husband and wife to raise your children in the nurture and instruction of the Lord in a way that pleases God and brings him great glory in a way so that each child will come to know Jesus as forgiver of their sin and leader of their life at an early age. You're trusting God to empower you to develop a Christ-honoring marriage. You're relying on the Holy Spirit to enable you to pursue God. You're committing yourself to be involved and committed to your local church. If you agree with these statements, say, we do. Now let's pray. Church, would you point your hands in this direction? Father, thank you for these beautiful families that stand before us. And right now, we dedicate. Fathers, if you'll take that oil that you were given before. Fathers, we dedicate Samuel Caleb Spurrier to you. We dedicate Elijah Jonathan Gabriel Millwood to you. And we dedicate Henry Wayman Jones to you. May these dads always look to you. May they love, serve their wife. May their wife love, respect their husband. May these families be families that are so committed, contagiously committed to you. And may these children grow up knowing that they are so deeply loved, both by you and their parents. We dedicate them to you. And now, church family, pointing your hands in this direction, say, we, the family of God, at A2 Children, dedicate these children to the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, families, as you go off, Shelby's going to meet you. We've got a Bible for every one of you, a dedication certificate that families, you'll want to sign but one more time, give them a hand as Zach comes up, leads us in this time. Amen. Come on. I love Baby Dedication <laughs> Sundays. They are always so beautiful. And hey, it's so awesome to have just family and friends of those who just were dedicated. We are honored to have you joining us in worship today. 
hey, church family, this is a wonderful time that we get to spend together. And I want to encourage us all to do something right now, and that's to fill out our online connection card, okay? So and you can actually do that in a couple of ways. You can use the QR code that's on the screen. Families, if you guys could just let us know that you were visiting with us today, we'd love to know that. And uh, if you have your church app, then you guys can pull that church app out and uh, just fill out that digital connection card. Go ahead and do that right now, guys. This is a really busy time of year, I understand. And hey, as a church, we want you to know that we got your back. We're praying for you. We're believing that God is meeting you right where you are in this season. If you're a first, second, or third time guest, we'd absolutely love to know that you were worshiping with us today. And there's a lot of cool things that you can check out on that app while you're at it. We have message notes there for you. And uh, so go ahead and fill out that connection card, guys. And uh, we'll be able to connect with you and pray with you over the course of this week. Uh, we're entering into the week of Christmas. Anybody excited for Christmas to be here? Come on. And uh, what's really exciting is that in only a few short days, we have our annual candlelight communion worship experience here on Christmas Eve night. And we are absolutely so excited to worship with you on Christmas Eve, 3 o'clock and 4.30 p.m. Those are our two worship times. So, hey, we invite you guys to come with your family. Bring your friends. Bring your coworkers. Bring somebody with you to worship with us. It's going to be an absolutely beautiful time of worship on Christmas Eve, guys. And it's only a few short days away. So make sure that you guys uh, join us on Christmas Eve this week. Um, also, one week from today, got to let you guys know this. On December 26th, we're going to have a special online virtual worship experience just to honor uh, the amazing men and women who have served so faithfully our A-team for the whole year. We want to honor them. We want to honor you as you're spending time with family. Maybe you're going to be traveling. It's the day after Christmas, but we're just still going to have church, right? And so what we've done, guys, is we've created a really, we're creating a really beautiful, unique, original worship experience that you'll be able to turn on as a family on December 26th, the morning after Christmas. You guys can join us there on A2TV, Facebook, YouTube, all the places, guys, at our same worship times, 9 and 1030. So make sure that you join us virtually one week from today. We will not be meeting here in this room to worship um, next Sunday, but we're still going to worship. Does that sound good? Cool, cool. Well, hey, uh, one more thing, guys, before I turn it over to our video announcements here. Um, you know, the past few weeks, I've just been getting up here and, um, you know, I've been, I've been encouraging us uh, to pray into a special year-end gift to the ministry of A2 Church. And, and just to be real with you guys, like every week that I've given this invitation, I've done so rather uncomfortably and timidly. <laughs> and some of you are probably like, yep, I could pick up on that, Zach. And, and, but it's true, and I just wanted to be real with you guys. But it's funny because, you know, it's not as if I've been feeling that way because I don't believe that giving or encouraging people to give is biblical. It's absolutely biblical. Paul does it, and, and we see many places all throughout Scripture on just the um, how biblical that is. And, and, you know, I also don't feel that way as if, you know, because I'm standing up here, it's like, oh, well, I'm asking them to give, but I don't give, because that's not true either. My wife Shelby and I, we give every single time a paycheck hits our account, and we've done that in our entire marriage. In fact, man, since my first paycheck at Chick-fil-A when I was 17 years old, I have honored God with the tithe, you know, and so, <laughs> well, I didn't expect to pause there, but, and listen, that first check from Chick-fil-A, it wasn't very big, but, and you know, it's just been so cool, though, just to see God's faithfulness and in, in how he's taking care of us. In fact, just this past week, um, I had to take my car to the shop, and it needed uh, just some, some work, and actually, the maintenance bill was, was rather expensive, but what's so cool is that God had actually already provided the funds for that bill a couple of weeks previously from just generosity in the church body, blessing Shelby and I with gifts that we weren't expecting. And then when I got that car bill, it was like, boom, God already took care of that. I love seeing how God just shows up when we're faithful, you know, in finances. And I also haven't um, felt this way just because I don't believe in the miracle of giving. Here's what I'm trying to say, guys. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. We want to invite you to enter into the wonderful, the mysterious, the, the, the inexplainable realm of trusting God with all of our being, including our finances. That's what I'm inviting you into as we close out this year, what has been an amazing year of ministry here at 2021, is to do that. And, and so really, guys, is before I turn it over to video announcements, I'm appealing to two different groups of people here today. The first group of people are 
people who are kind of like me and Shelby. And, and every week, you know, we're, we're faithful and we honor God with the tithe every single time we, we get money in our account. And, and to those of you who are in that group, I just say, keep it up. Like, stay faithful. Good job. That's awesome. And then the other group is people, maybe you're here and you've been waiting to the end of the year to honor God with a whole year's worth of tithe. Or maybe you have found yourself inconsistent in your giving. Or maybe you've never given. And to you, my encouragement is to put the Lord your God to the test in your finances. Taste and see that the Lord is good, that he is faithful, that he will provide for you. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. And so we have all, all these ways that you can give guys online, giving boxes in the back. As we close out what has been an incredible year of ministry, thank you for who you are and for partnering with us. It's been a great year. We love you guys. I'm going to turn it over to those video announcements. We've got a few more things going on. Hey, I'm Leanne, and these are the announcements this week. Declaration 2021 was one of the most powerful things we did this year. So we're kicking off 2022 in the same way. There's power in declaring God's word together. So we're reading the Bible out loud in one week, starting January 9th. It's not too early to sign up to read because the spots fill up quickly. You can go to declaration2022.church to find the spots that work best for you. It's hard to believe, but our Christmas Eve worship experience is only five days away. We'll have Christmas songs you know and love, along with worship, a message, the lighting of the candles, and Holy Communion. Remember, this year, we have new times. We'll be gathering at 3 and 4.30 p.m. It's also the last time we'll meet together on campus for the year since we'll have a virtual worship experience on December 26th. That's right, the campus will be closed next Sunday, December 26th, but we'll live stream at our usual times, 9 and 10.30 a.m. Thank you for letting us be a part of what makes the Christmas season so special. Be sure to check us out at a2.church, download our app, and follow us on social to stay up to date, stay connected, and stay involved. That's all the news we have for you, so prepare your hearts for today's message. All right. Well, if you want to open up the notes that are contained in your church app, go ahead and do so. We're going to cover a lot of ground in just a little bit of time. Uh, some time ago, I became aware of the work of a palliative caregiver, Bronnie Ware. She's written a book, Top Five Regrets, and in that book, she outlines the top five regrets of people nearing the end of life. We've talked about some of those regrets, regrets and we've talked about turning wishful thinking into intentional living. The first regret was, I wish I would have pursued my dreams. The second regret was, I wish I would have let myself be happy. And the third regret is this, I wish I could let go of this hurt. Bronnie Weir indicated that in the hundreds of end-of-life patients she cared for, this was a recurring theme that many, in fact, had taken on illness as a result of hurt, pain, bitterness that they had actually held on to for a number of years. So this is the intentional decision I want to challenge you to make this Sunday before Christmas. It will come up on the screen. My intentional decision, soul wholeness. I'll move from hurt to wholeness by revealing my hurts, releasing those who hurt me, Replacing old tapes with God's truth, refocusing on my future, and reaching out to help somebody else. Now, I want us to say that out loud and together. And by the way, I know this right now, some of you are going to be saying it by faith. It's not true, at least in your gut. But you need to say it so that your mind will start to hear what your spirit is declaring in this moment. So are you ready? Let's just start with the words, I will. This is an intentional decision about moving towards soul wholeness. I will move from hurt to wholeness by revealing my hurts, releasing those who hurt me, replacing old tapes with God's truth, and reaching out to help someone else. Wow, that was great participation. Show of hands on this one. 
Do any of these words describe your experience? Just lift them up at will. Disappointment, hurt, pain, wounded, loss. Weak, guilt, shame, fear, intimidated, invisible, inadequate, insecure, terminal. Anyone experiencing any or all of those, hands up in the air just as high as they will go. Thank goodness I'm speaking to the right audience this morning. Uh, several years ago, famous psychologist, renowned cosmetic surgeon, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, wrote several books telling the stories of people whose lives were transformed when they got a new face, cosmetic surgery. Many had been through severe accidents, experienced major trauma, as well as severe facial scarring and disfigurement. And the scars had left these people feeling insecure, inferior, inadequate, afraid. They got a new face. And a number of them, upon getting a new face, blossom with new confidence, new enthusiasm, actually a new lease on life. But as time went on, Maltz discovered something else. He discovered that many of those people, for many of them, cosmetic surgery did nothing at all. They still felt insecure, depressed, anxious, afraid. As a result, he came to this conclusion. If you want to have lasting change in the human personality, you must heal more than physical scars, the physical scars an individual bears. You've got to heal their emotional scars as well. You've got to heal more than external wounds. You've got to heal internal wounds too. Now, if you're living... If you're breathing, chances are you've been hurt. Somebody broke your heart, crushed your dreams, ridiculed you, rejected you, belittled you, intimidated you, powered up on you. For others, you've experienced hurt that I can't even mention on this stage. It was so severe, so traumatic. I've met with a number of those people, in fact, just this week. I interacted with two people, the pain and trauma they experienced as children is indescribable. Now, for many of us, when we're hurt, we grieve the loss, we process the pain, and we eventually heal. Even though we end up carrying scars for the rest of our life, we basically heal. But sometimes the wounds inflicted go so deep, the pain is so severe that healing, resolution, recovery, it involves a much longer process, and sometimes you wonder, will it ever occur? And when Christmas hits, there's something about this time of year that exacerbates that pain all the more. I mean, any of you feel that? We even talk about depression escalating during Christmas, early New Year's. Most of you have heard of an Old Testament guy named Job. His book is actually the oldest book in the Bible. If you've been walking through a season of hurt and pain, his story will resonate with you. Job was a guy who had the world by the tail, seemed that everything was going his way. Growth charts were up and to the right. And then all of a sudden, he experienced this loss, pain, wounds, hurt that none of us prayerfully will ever go through. We're talking about catastrophic financial loss, devastating investment losses, the loss of all 10 of his children. Imagine that, all 10 children gone in a single act of nature. Fractures and distance in his relationship with his wife, a lack of compassion coupled with accusation, judgment on the part of his friends. It's so severe that this is the way Job described his life. Check this out. Job chapter 6, if my misery could be weighed, if you could pile the whole bitter load on the scales, it would be heavier than all the sand of the sea. In other words, the massive amount of pain, heartbreak, loss, misery I've experienced, I'm presently carrying, it's more than any one man should ever have to bear. Job's pain runs so deep that in Job 6, Job is mad at himself, He's ticked off at God. He's mad at his wife. He's really mad at his friends. Life has hit him so hard that in this moment, he thinks death is actually a preferable option. Hurt, loss, woundedness. Have you ever noticed this? They all often involve other people. The words and actions of people often create some of the most devastating emotional pain any of us will ever have to bear. And for Job, that pain came at the hands of his loving wife. I really do believe she loved him. And it also came at 
at the hands of several well-intentioned, but incredibly way-off friends. Listen to how he describes it in Job 19, verse num number 19. My closest friends detest me. Those I've loved have turned against me. Anybody remember that nursery rhyme your parents sort of drummed into your brain when you were an elementary child? They were trying to prepare you for the drama you were going to experience at elementary school, maybe in middle school. And that, li that little rhyme went something like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Anybody remember that? How many of you have lived long enough to know? Yeah, right. That's, that's baloney. I mean, as a pastor, I'm talking to people on a regular basis who are still carrying wounds spoken over them by a parent, a spouse, a teacher. Here's what the book of Proverbs says about it. Proverbs 12 says, this is the message, and I love it. Rash language cuts and maims. But there is healing in the words of the wise. In the NIV, it reads like this. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. And some of us have experienced that. What people say about you hurts you. What you think people think about you hurts you as well. I mean, can anybody think back? It's a lot of years these days. But can anybody think back about high school? And that little group gathered at the lockers. And you see the looks, you see the body language, you see the whispers, the stares, the expressions, the pointing of the finger. And when you think about that group, something pierces you to the core. Even these 20, 30, 40 years later, you still carry that pain. What people say about us, think about us, what people do to us can create pain and hurt that seemingly will not go away. And here's one of the facts about living in a sin-scarred, sin-shattered world. It's this fact. Life is tough. And you're going to end up wounded in this world. Check out the words of Job again. This is Job chapter 21. Listen to how he describes life when we don't deal with those deep wounds. He, he says, one person dies in full vigor completely secure and at ease. Have you ever seen their post on Instagram? Have you ever hovered over their face, their, their posts on Facebook? One person dies in full vigor, completely secure and at ease, well nourished in body, bones rich with marrow, but then another dies in bitterness of soul, never having enjoyed anything good. Wouldn't that be an awful description of your life? To get all the way to the end and die in such a state of bitterness that when you look back at your life, you think this, I didn't enjoy one thing that was good about my life. That's why the writer of Hebrews gives a challenge to us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, I memorized this passage long ago. It has stuck with me. And look at what it says. And we're going to read the part that's underlined out loud and together. Are you ready? Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Look at this. Look at this. This is so critical. The writer of Hebrews, we're not certain who wrote this book. But the writer of Hebrews says that we owe one another a communal responsibility. I'm responsible for you. You're responsible for me. When you see my faith sagging, when I see your faith sagging, when I see despair, depression, discouragement ruling your day, or you see it ruling mine... We're to see to it that none of us miss out on the grace of God. And then this exhortation, let's read the portion that's underlined out loud and together. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Just leave that up on the screen for a few moments, if you would, Emily. The word bitterness, if you're taking notes, in Hebrews 12, 15, carries the idea of poison. It describes something that it's extremely sharp. It's biting. It's smoldering resentment or a brooding, grudge-filled attitude that literally acts as poison on the inside of you. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking that bitterness is justifiable. Well, Chris, you just... You don't know what he did. You don't know what she said. You don't understand the way they betrayed me. You don't know the pain. 
Uh, the word bitterness, I will not attempt to say the Greek word, but it refers to something that's acidic, something that will literally eat you alive. Did you know we now have medical evidence that bitterness can affect your physical health? Have you ever said to somebody, you're real pain in, in, in the neck or somewhere lower down on the anatomy? You've said it. Here's the point. They really may be that. Because bitterness leaks. And it affects the way you feel. It affects your physical health. It leaks into your stomach. It creates ulcers. It leaks into your neck, creating neck aches. It leads into your head. It creates headaches. How can I know whether or not I'm bitter? Here's, here's a thought. Bitter people are often historians and archaeologists. They can talk about and describe some past hurt, some past trauma, some past experience, like it just occurred yesterday. I mean, in vivid detail. They rehearse. Not long ago, I met with a, a close personal friend. And 20 years ago, this person experienced trauma. I'm talking about horrible trauma. Horrible trauma. And that trauma of 20 years ago is still controlling that individual today. Now, it's likely that the person who perpetrated that har trauma has moved on with their life and not giving this individual a second thought. But that individual who's still reliving that trauma is still giving that person power, influence over their life these 20 years later, still giving them the ability to sabotage any expectation they have for wholeness, soul wholeness in this life. Now bring back up Hebrews 12, 15 again. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. We owe one another this responsibility. If you see this in me, you're supposed to call it out. If I see this in you, I'm supposed to call it out. Not in a judgmental way. Not in a crass, arrogant, harsh way. But in a loving way. I'm to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't give that individual that kind of influence in your life. Because why? Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you and everybody say the last two words out loud and together. Corrupting. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You've got to say it again. Corrupting. Thomas Brooks, we're going old school here. In his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, describes something he calls the ordinary demonic. Here's what he's writing about. He's writing about spiritual warfare dressed up in blue jeans and a pair of Clarks or Nike Air Force Ones. He's saying that sometimes when we hold on to bitterness, this is actually, according to Brooks, a form of spiritual warfare whereby the evil one is sabotaging our entire life. And we never think of it as spiritual because, after all, the pain that was perpetrated was real. This devastation that occurred was real. The betrayal actually occurred. The spouse was actually unfaithful. The parent actually physically or sexually abused you. The friend betrayed you. It's real, and we don't think of it as spiritual. But according to Thomas Brooks, when we allow bitterness to reside, it turns into spiritual warfare whereby the evil one begins to have his way with us. The writer of Hebrews says that bitterness grows. It will not only affect you, it will affect everybody around you. Parents, parents, you can infect your kids with the bitterness you carry around some broken relationship in your past. Pastors have infected entire churches. Have you ever heard pastors who speak, and when they speak, it's like they're ticked off at the whole world? And what do they raise up? They raise up a body, a church family, that acts as if it's ticked off at the whole world. Employers can infect employees. Husbands, you can affect your wife. Wives. You can infect your husband. That's why the writer of Hebrews challenges us. Whatever you do, get rid of bitterness. 
Don't let bitterness take root in your life because when it does, it will not only affect you, it leaks, it will affect. That poison goes out and affects everyone around you. <laughs> Anybody seen the new Bond film? Derek has. It, I am so glad that movies are back, at least good movies, because for a while there was nothing good, and the new Bond flick is actually really exciting. I want to tell you an illustration from the flick, but it just occurred to me that some of you haven't seen it. I would spoil the whole flick for you. Let me just say it like this. Let me say it like this without spoiling the whole flick for people in the room. But there's a great illustration to be had if I could do it and not spoil it for you. An evil scientist has developed a formula whereby he can target poison that will affect certain people. There's a problem with the poison, however, that once you're infected, you're going to infect everybody around you as well. And therefore, you have to make certain choices and decisions about what you're going to do. That's the way it is with bitterness. Now, let's move to the good news since I've taken like 16 minutes to describe the bad news. Let's take 16 minutes and describe the good news. You can go free. You can experience healing. The idea that I can't heal, I can't get freedom in this area, or I'll never get over this. Let me just say, those aren't ideas based on the Word of God. You can and you will if you want to. But, but you don't know the extent of the trauma. You don't know the depth of the pain. I'm certain I don't. There are stories that when I hear, my heart breaks. And I wonder how, why. But I can tell you this. Not only have I heard those kinds of stories and that kind of heartbreak and that kind of pain, I've also seen the grace of God so massively transform hurt, pain, sorrow, loss, sadness, that I stood back and I looked at an individual, I saw the grace of God that was operating in their life, and I thought, other than the grace of God, there is no explanation possible for the way they live life with joy, with fulfillment, with satisfaction. In fact, they've become an astounding testimony of God's massive ability to heal, set free, and deliver. Yes, you can get over it. Yes, you can heal. Yes, God can set you free. Free. And let me say one more thing. There's a philosopher who said it this way, and this is the problem with many of us when we experience this kind of trauma. We begin to define ourselves by that trauma. And this philosopher wrote, I quote, as long as you make an identity for yourself out of your pain, you'll never be free from it. Stop making an identity out of your pain. You're more than whatever. You're more than that divorce. You're more than that betrayal. You're more than the devastation of that awful abuse perpetrated upon you. You are more than those words spoken over you by that significant other. You are more than all of those things. In fact, there is only one individual who has the right to label you. And it's not anybody in this room. He sits on a heavenly throne. And that individual is your father. He is your God. He says, you are my child. I love you before I even created the world. I unconditionally loved you. I accepted you. I made you to be like me. You are more than a conqueror, more than an overcomer because of what I did through my son who died the death you should have died. He then rose again victorious over death and hell. He has given you a new name that nobody else can know. That name is yours because you're a child of God. Let him label you. Now, I've got five blanks that we're going to fill in, but don't worry. I'll fill those in like boom, 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 boom. I don't know if that was five booms or not. I lost count. 
But I just want to give you this. Since it's Christmas. When the prophet Isaiah, who saw with more clarity the ministry of Messiah, Jesus, than any prophet, we're talking 700 years prior to Jesus' birth. When he looked forward to the Messiah, I want you to look at how he described him in Isaiah 42. This is what he says, beginning at verse 1. And boy, the, the whole chapter is absolutely amazing. You might want to just pull out Isaiah 42, read it this afternoon. It's so beautiful. Here's what Isaiah said. Look at my servant. That, that's what Messiah gets called. These are called the servant songs. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. In other words, there's coming a day when all of these wrongs will be set right. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. In other words, he'll not need the spotlight. He'll not demand attention. It's really interesting to me that the ministry of Jesus, Matthew 12, this gets quoted and assigned to Jesus as the fulfillment of this Messianic prophecy. And one of the hallmarks of Jesus' ministry is that he didn't fight for the spotlight. He didn't demand the attention. In fact, often after performing extraordinary miracles, he would say to the person who had received the miracle, don't tell a soul. Just keep this to yourself. The next statement, verse 3, for probably 30 years. In fact, it goes back so far that I wrote my first message on Isaiah 42, verse 3, before I had a computer. It's on a typewriter. That's how long these words have gripped me. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who've been wrong. I've got to read verse 3 again. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who've been wrong. He will not crush the weakest reed. In those days, reeds would often be chosen, and they would be chosen and then shaped, formed into musical instrument upon which musicians would play. But if in the shaping process, a reed became bruised, bent, bowed, and unuseful as a musical instrument, here's what the artisan would do. Just break the reed. Why work with a reed that's bent, a reed that's bowed, a reed that's going to require extra effort when you can go get plenty of other reeds along the river bank. Messiah will not break a bruised reed. He will look at the person bruised and say, I know you've been broken. I know it seems as if you will never recover, but I'm going to be here. And I'm going to walk with you through this process as long as it takes. But you know this. I will never set you aside. I will never put you aside. I will never say you're unuseful to me because your process takes longer than others around you. I will never break a bruised reed. That is our Messiah. <laughs> then, then he says... A flickering, smoldering wick or candle... He'll, you know, that wick, my wife loves candles. I can't even imagine how much money we've spent on candles. And the good news about her stewardship is, is she burns them until they burn out. I mean, they, they are consumed. But, you know, in those days, you would take a little wick, you would cut it, you would put it in olive oil usually to provide light to the home. But when it would get, when it would get to the end of the wick and just start smoldering and smoking, you would douse out the wick, cut something new, apply new olive oil, start over. And of the Messiah, no, no, no. Just because you've been used, abused, and you feel like you're almost burned out. 
I will not quench. I will not put out a flickering candle. Now, let me do this, Emily. I'm going to skip way ahead a couple of verses. I'm not going to read verse 4 in that original translation. I'm going to go to the message translation of verse 3 and 4. Let me, let me read it to you the way Eugene Peterson describes it. This is the word some of you need to hear. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt. He won't disregard the small and insignificant. But he will, I love this language, steadily and firmly set things right. He will not tire out and quit. He won't be stopped until he's finished his work to set things right on earth. That is the ministry of our Jesus. That's what God has promised. So, so how do I heal? I told you I was going to go boom, 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 boom. Okay, here are those five booms. You ready? And then I'm going to tell you a story, and then we're going to respond. Reveal your hurt. You can repress it, express it, or confess it. Reveal it. Reveal it to yourself. Admit your pain. Denial isn't a river in Egypt. It's more like quicksand. Stop denying the pain. Get real with someone you trust. According to the depth of the trauma, you might need to see a counselor. And this church believes in counseling. Dr. Deanna Park is here, runs one of the greatest clinics in Birmingham. Birmingham Anxiety Trauma Therapy Center. I probably screwed up that name terribly right then, but I was doing it from memory. Get a counselor. My wife and I both have sought counseling. Why? We need it. Get real with someone you trust. Get real with God. You can be real with him this morning. Here's the second boom. Release the person or people who've hurt you. You need to know this. Bitterness is the gift that keeps on giving. Forgiveness isn't about saying it didn't really happen, it didn't really hurt. Forgiveness is about giving up the right to get even. Forgiveness isn't even about the person who hurt you ever saying, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. They may never say those words. Lou Smeads writes this. He says, the first and often the only person to be healed by forgiveness is the person who does the forgiveness. And originally in the Greek, the word forgive meant to release or untie. In other words, I'm not tying myself to that stuff any longer. Three, replace old tapes with God's truth. Forgiveness releases the debt, but it doesn't free you from all the lie-based emotions that are still rumbling around in here. Your brain is like a tape recorder. It's recorded every single experience. Your five senses have went through. It's all in there, all the good things, all the bad things. The problem is this. When you are a child, especially, your brain doesn't have the ability to distinguish, perceive between lies and truth. So often we're holding on to lies spoken over us. And what we need to do is willfully reject the lies. And instead, those are the old tapes. I know I'm going old school. Some of you, old tapes. What is a tape? What is a tape? I don't know what a tape. Do you mean MP3? Okay, just say it that way. MP3. Place old tapes with God's truth. You need to get rid of those labels like rejected, neglected, unwanted, unaccepted, unimportant, unloved. You need to receive the labels that God wants to place upon you. Valued, accepted, invited, adopted, important, capable, loved, forgiven, free. That's what God says about you. Four, refocus on your future. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Some of you need to adopt a new vision for your future. Instead of allowing that trauma, that train wreck of 20 years ago to define you, you need to start asking God to give you a new dream for today, tomorrow, next month, next year. Five, reach out and help someone else. You'll know you're healing from trauma when you're actually beginning to give yourself away in service to others. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 4. God comforts us every time we have trouble, so when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the trouble we ourselves have received. So let me go back. 
I want to share with you one of the most meaningful stories I've ran across recently about how you can trust God with these kinds of pain. Great book by Kyle Strobel, Jaman Goggin. It's called The Way of the Dragon or The Way of the Lamb. Uh, here's the thesis of this book. Really cool thought. That there's so much in 21st century Christianity that is around power, popularity, prestige, all of these kinds of things. That Strobel and Goggin sought out leaders who for decades had demonstrated lives of humble service, incredible wisdom, significant character for decades. I'm talking about people like Marva Don, J.I. Packer, Eugene Peterson, Dallas Willard, John Perkins. And let me share this story, the story of James and Rita Houston. What Strobel and Goggin did, they went around, interviewed all of these greats in the faith who were just quietly living out their existence in old age and asked them about weakness, vulnerability, pain, hurt, loss, and how God could minister in those aspects. They spent three days with James and Rita Houston. James, at the time of the visit, was 90 years old. This was only in 2017, by the way. James had been mentored, imagine this, by C.S. Lewis. Would that be crazy or what? James had been personally mentored by C.S. Lewis. And Rita was childhood friends with, with John Stott. We're talking some of the greats of the Christian faith. He and Rita had been married for decades, and both Strobel and Goggin said, the thing that struck us about our three days was the way James loved his spouse. Just the beauty of love that existed because at this time, Rita was struggling with dementia. Now, she herself had been a university professor. But even though her wit was still sharp and oftentimes she was scintillating in her insight, often the dementia would reappear and she would forget she was entertaining guests in her home. And as the visit neared an end, Strobel and Goggin looked at James and Rita and said, where have you learned most significantly that strength really does come in weakness in these moments of your life? And Rita tried to answer, but dementia had taken hold and the thoughts weren't very clear. James jumped in. This is what James said. As he lovingly looked at his wife, he said, you see, Rita is worried that as she loses her memory, she'll forget Jesus. So I remind her, what matters most is not that you remember him, but that he remembers you. I just came to tell you this Sunday before Christmas, regardless of what you've been through, what you're going through, he still remembers you. He will never forget you. And if there's hurt and trauma in your life, he is the God who wants to heal you today. So let's, let's just pray. Say this prayer out loud, but not alone. Just say this out loud. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Say it once more. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Now just listen. Let him speak. Remember we talked about disappointment, hurt, pain, wound, woundedness, loss, weakness, guilt, shame, fear. Those of you who feel intimidated, invisible, inadequate, insecure, terminal. And 90% of the hands went up in this room. Will you reveal your hurt to him? Can you today just say a prayer to release those who've hurt you? Will you start replacing old tapes with God's truth? Let me just say to you, that's a process that I have to repeat several times. I have a confession that I say over myself regularly. This morning, I said it before I walked onto the stage. Because I know I need to replace old tapes with God's truth. Refocus on your future. Will you reach out and start helping someone else? Father, we trust you in this moment. We trust you in this moment and we ask you 
the ministry, your grace. I'm just going to ask you to place yourself in that posture to receive. If comfortable, the palms of your hands pointed up. That's just a posture that says, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to reveal my hurt to you, to receive from you. Nathan's just going to sing that. That bridge that we just sang, all my devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. I don't remember the lyrics specifically, but we're going to sing that out loud to our God. Giving him all of that pain, all of that hurt, all of that trauma. You ready? Sing it with Nathan. Our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion, poured out. like to ask you to stand he's going to lead us in that again but I just I just have this thought come to my mind Isaiah 54 describes a person dealing with devastating hurt pain loss that had evidently went on for decades and the word of the prophet in Isaiah 54 was seeing barren woman seeing those of you who've never had children seeing for greater are the children of the barren woman than the woman who is at home with her husband the days of your barrenness and shame are over, for I, I am your lover and your bridegroom. These are the words of God spoken over people he dearly loves. So as we sing that, my affection, my devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Just take all that pain, all that hurt, pour it out on the feet of Jesus. Give him all of that. And then we're going to break into Jesus, we love you. I'll ask for prayer teams to come. And we're going to be here to minister to people and the Lord is going to free you as you walk into Christmas this year. Sing it out loud. Worship out loud. Our affection, our devotion.
Hey, Emily, would you bring up our benediction, please? We're all going to pray this aloud and together. You ready? Would you pray it with me? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you need prayer about... Thanks so much for worshiping with us. Check us out on YouTube and on all of our social media channels. So you don't miss any of the action, be sure to follow us and subscribe. We meet on campus and online every Sunday at 9 and 10.30 a.m. We also post on-demand content on A2.Church and our YouTube channel at least every Sunday afternoon. If you were inspired by today's message and you want to partner with us in sharing God's love in this message, you can do so by going to a2.church slash give. For more info about A2 and the additional content we make available, click the link in the description below or just visit us at a2.church. Again, thank you for watching and worshiping. God bless.